Hello and welcome to Maverick Dreamers and Thinkers. I'm Chloe Cho. Back in 2003, when I had signed up to cover the war in Iraq for a TV network, the decision ended up getting held up for months due to the spike in violence and bloodshed, along with highly publicized beheadings. While my plans to cover the Middle East were pending, I traveled to Central and Eastern Europe for a TV series called Changing Europe. The region was re-emerging on the global stage after the fall of communism, representing hope for a new Europe. I recall arriving in a bustling Warsaw as skyscrapers were going up everywhere in a sign of the booming real estate market. Freshly admitted to the European Union, Poland exuded the confidence of a frontrunner among former bloc nations. It also appeared keen on shaking off the Soviet influence and the scars of war. The rebirth of Poland as part of the European Union marked an important chapter as Poles forged ahead towards a brighter and more prosperous future. There was an immense amount of pride and energy in cities and countryside. Entrepreneurs were turning their ideas into new businesses, transforming Poland into a regional hub in high technology, and farms and agricultural producers were introducing technology to step up their game to rival their competitors in Western Europe. The newfound wealth created a vibrant nightlife as chic restaurants and bars served up an assorted array of exotic vodkas. 16 years on, Poland is enjoying a golden era with recession-free economic growth since 1992, a remarkable track record only beaten by Australia by just one year. Poland has averaged annual growth of 4.2% since 1992, making it the seventh largest economy in the European Union. As Poland looks to the east for its next wave of growth, it's celebrating a new high in relations with Singapore. Traveling between the two countries has never been easier thanks to a direct air route between Singapore and Warsaw on Polish Airlines, LOT. Singapore's port operator PSA made a game-changing investment into Gdansk, the largest port in Poland and also the fastest growing port in Europe, creating DCT Gdansk, the largest container terminal in Poland. As the two countries seek closer relations, they're trying to create synergies and new business opportunities as Singapore and Poland emerge as key gateways to Asia and Europe. A forum was held in Singapore recently under the title Singapore Business and Maritime Mixer. Joining me on the session, Martin Osofsky, Vice President of Infrastructure, Port of Gdansk Authority. Markson believes that Gdansk is the most versatile ocean port in Central Europe and that connectivity will be critical to achieving its strategic goals in the 2020s. This is just the beginning and this huge investment program was the key and was a very efficient instrument for our crew, for our employees to get expertise, to get skills to deliver larger projects, to deliver projects which are strategic for not only for five, ten years, but for the next decades. Laurent Spiesens, Deputy CEO, DCT Gdansk, which has emerged as the largest container terminal in the Baltic following Singapore port operator PSA's game-changing investment in Gdansk. Laurent's vision is to transform Gdansk into the Singapore of the Baltic. In a nutshell, what do we want to do in Gdansk? We are the largest container terminal in the Baltic. We have unrestricted sea access all year round, which is important. No limitations uh, because of some of the ports in uh, the Baltic uh, have ice restrictions. We can handle the largest vessels, no problem. We have a unique location that has made us the largest growing terminal, not only in the Baltic, but in Europe. Mikolaj Trunin, Deputy Director, Invest in Pomerania, a regional investor assistance center. Mikolaj's job is to promote investments in Pomerania, the larger Gdansk area. 
IT plays like a vital role in that. We have currently the biggest R&D center of Intel working on mainly embedded solutions for autonomous driving. Then there is Amazon, you probably all know Alexa. Alexa, in fact, was born in Gdańsk Korea. It was a Polish company which developed, it was called at that time, Ivona Software. Amazon bought the company and developed, right? So if you are using Alexa, you are using the software produced by the engineers from Gdańsk. Gerald Lim, Independent Director, HiP International Limited of Singapore, a turnkey electronic manufacturer that's been running operations in Poland since 2005. HiP makes electronic items from smartphones and wearable devices to coffee pots and home appliances for big international brands. What we do then is essentially, for those of you in the electronic business, we are in joint development, manufacturing, original design manufacturing, original equipment manufacturing, JDM, ODM, OEM. So we have about 380 staff. They're practically all Polish. And, and I think the good news is they tell us we don't need you guys around. And I tell you that's a compliment because it's a very self-sufficient uh, operation, run almost locally, done doing all the functions and serving the local market. And I think this is a great testimony. Joanna Scherholz, CEO, Business Hub PL, Director of International Projects, Poland Today. Joanna established the Association of Polish Chambers of Commerce Abroad in 2017 and has also founded CEE Connectivity, a think tank. She's been actively promoting Polish businesses abroad for many years. All those years, I tried to be uh, like an um, ambassador for Poland. I was a founder of Polish Chamber of Commerce in the Netherlands. I was a board member and director for three years. And I was the founder of um, Association of Polish Chamber of Commerce Worldwide. And I always try to be internationally engaged. And I always try to be um, like a mission of Poland today. I always want to bring Poland to the world and the world to Poland. To kick things off, I think it's important to be a little bit of a devil's advocate and be a little and look at Poland from a critical eye, if you will. So it's good that Poland has had this amazing economic run of recession-free growth for the past 28 years, a record which is only beaten by Australia. Good on you. However, on the other side, what happens when the tables turn? You're the guy with a lot of money in your pocket, pumping in millions, if not billions, over a multi-year horizon. If you look at recent examples of huge investments, huge decisions by companies like China's Alibaba and Huawei, Alibaba chose Belgium and Huawei chose the Netherlands. The key reasons were simple and clear. It's either flexible VAT regimes or fiscal support are some of those incentives being, being backed so that you get the big guns, the big companies to invest in Gdansk and do business in Gdansk. I think, yes, this uh, uh, with a pinch of salt, I think it's always good to, uh, to look at uh, uh, the situation from different perspectives because uh, Poland and Central Europe is not the ideal uh, country, ideal destination. We got some challenges, we got some hurd hurdles to cross and some headwinds, of course. Uh, but the examples of uh, Alibaba and Chinese uh, business, I think it's more related with uh, some political risk and some uh, more complex reasons, not only the tax uh, uh, regime or VAT regime, which uh, to a degree is similar uh, among the EU, EU countries. Uh, maybe some details and maybe some, uh, um, uh, some small amendments uh, are, are different in Poland than in other countries. But, uh, but also, this is also the element of the recent success that uh, uh, closing the gap on, uh, um, in tax uh, uh, cheating or some uh, grey zone, let's put it this way, uh, gives Poland another boost of uh, public money for uh, for infrastructure, for new spendings. And regarding the infrastructure, I'm got this kind of the comfort that even if this uh, cycle of uh, recession or some uh, smaller, more modest growth uh, can last two, three years, the cycle of delivery of the infrastructure is longer. 
So uh, this is our idea and this is our philosophy. We cannot stop, we cannot push the brake because uh, the, the, always the, the market will recover in some, in some years. And um, this is the part of the this is the part of the answer to your question. Another issue you um, I think rightly um, mentioned is uh, yes we think and we present ourselves as an uh, emerging economy, but the truth is that still there are no well known global brands of any of the Polish company. And it means that despite the fact that we get constant 30 year growth, we really started from the really bottom and uh, now we are in the middle of this uh, of this road and a lot of work ahead of us right and also Laurent, um you presented us a great case you know the, the waters don't freeze you know deep water big vessels it's all good but when you actually hear the perspective of traders exporters importers the key headache the major headaches happen when the shipment arrives because then the shipment needs to get loaded onto freight cargo, rail, and that's when the bottlenecks begin. And that's also still an issue. So from where you sit, what is being done to ease the bottlenecks so that once the shipments, whether it's e-commerce or whatever you bought from the consumer side, they get it as soon as possible because at the end of the day, that's what's going to boost your business and overall vision. Okay, that's a good question. Um... I told you that uh, rail is important uh, in uh, Gdansk. Uh, when we look at our local cargo, today about 35% of the cargo goes out and comes in by rail, and 65% is handled by truck. Uh, rail is a bottleneck today. Uh, internally, within our uh, terminal, I explained to you that we are making huge investments, in total about 20 million, in order to improve our rail capacity. On the other hand, in Poland, the government has uh, made uh, a lot of uh, projects in order to improve the rail in Poland. Uh, the government is spending money, but also e EU money is spent in order to improve the rail infrastructure. When we look at rail, you have three components. You have the axle weight, which is important. You have the speed that is important, and you have the length of the rail that is important. When you look at uh, the, the, the railway in Poland, you see today that there are quite a lot of uh, areas where you don't meet the maximum rail uh, axle weight, where you don't meet the uh, maximum speed, and where you don't meet the maximum length of the uh, trains. So a lot of projects are going on, and I th uh, we think that by 2023, a lot of those bottlenecks should uh, have been improved. Also, what is important, uh, one of the areas where we would like to grow is not only in Poland, but also in the neighboring countries. It's important that the rail access to those countries, the cross-border rail connections that they improve, especially to uh, Czech Republic and to Slovakia. Is that what you also see as well? What, what, what are your views about the bottlenecks? Well, except this uh, hard infrastructure, which is really improving right now. And this 2023 is just the end of another EU perspective. So it's a very good deadline. I think the biggest challenge is uh, uh, labor shortage. We got actually no um, uh, unemployment uh, in Poland. In Poland, it's less than 5%. In Gdańsk area, it's less than 2%. So we have to import, if we can say that, almost 2 million people from Ukraine. You cannot see because they look exactly like us, but we are the biggest immigrant country in Europe, right? And they work hard, and I think this, is the big, the, this will be the biggest challenge. So demographic gap and attracting people and uh, intermingled them into our culture and our society. Right, and 2022, 2023 um, is a critical time period. So once the bottlenecks improve, imagine this. The government's plan is to boost minimum wages to 4,000 zlotys by 2022, which in U.S. dollar terms, it's about 1,000 euros U.S. dollars, depending on the currency rate. And when you think about it, then that means all of a sudden, in such a short period, Polish wages, minimum wages, end up matching Spanish minimum wages. So from where you sit, you're trying to, you're trying to promote investment. It's a huge challenge because until now, Poland's success story has been, boast, has been based on two things, cheap labor and low wages. You're breaking that. So could Poland 
Or could Gdansk, Pomerania, end up becoming a victim of its own success? Well, we are no longer a cheap labor country, right? We were in the 1990s when the influx of foreign direct investment started. We were a cheap labor country when we joined the European Union in 2004, but since that time we've made a huge progress. Of course, we are a cheaper location than Western countries, yet we are much more expensive than Eastern countries, like I know Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine. I think currently we are like an optimum location when it comes to quality price ratio, right? So this is like this optimum that we are paying to investors, right, for their investment, yeah? And yeah, I suppose that generally, as you could have heard from my presentation, right, we are not attracting investments which are based on low and cheap labor, right? So in fact, in the last years, we have lost many of these projects that we were short, they said, but finally they went to, to Serbia, to Romania, to Bulgaria, right? Uh, but from the other side, we have won a lot of projects that are based on highly skilled labor. So that's generally it's the future of Poland. We understood that wages, minimum wages are going to go up and Poland is no longer about cheap labor. Wow, then we are dealt with a new blow, which is that there are labor shortages on top of higher wages. And plus, let's not forget, what is the median age of Poland today? It's over 40. It's aging. It's the same problem that China is facing. China no longer can be the factory of the world. Then what, what can you say about that? An investor comes to you, wants to make a 10-year horizon, 5-year horizon plan. Whoa, you guys have people who are aging. <laughs> Wages are going up. You need to import people. Why am I going to choose my factory when Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, everybody is out to be the gateway and also the manufacturing base? I'm giving you all the tough questions. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll get you a drink in the evening. <laughs> well, actually, it's like a very important issue and uh, it's a bottleneck. Yeah, definitely. And I totally agree with Mr. Osowski that this is the issue that we have to work on. As Invest in Pomerania, we have already addressed this issue. We have uh, founded an initiative, Live More Pomerania. So we are just going around Poland, also Ukraine, encouraging people, young people, mainly students and young graduates to move to Gdańsk area. We are just going there with employers. We have started also the, the web page with the landing pages of the companies that have the open recruitment processes. So this is one thing. The other thing that we have already started a relocation scholarship. It's for IT specialists mainly, right? So if you're an IT company and you want to employ a person from other parts of Poland of Euro or Europe, we are providing this relocation scholarship for him, right? So this is this is the issue, yeah. But definitely the other thing is uh, retraining, right? Because generally economy is changing, right? All the processes are being automated, which means that the labor needs to be retrained very often and move from one sector to another. And Gerald, so for a company like HIP, and these issues are nothing new, you know, aging, high wages, high cost of living. I mean, Singapore is used to this. So when you hear about these issues, um, at least when you go to the board meetings, how do the board members react? Because when you chose Poland as a manufacturing base back in the days in 2005, it represented something that Singapore wasn't, right? a young, youthful population willing to settle for low wages, and all of a sudden, it's, it's getting up there. Do you look at another base? What is the strategy? I think for us, it's quite simple. Be close to the customer. So I think being there is a strategic thing, and thankfully, in our kind of business, being close to the customer is important. In all this IoT stuff, you can be anywhere in the world, right? But we're making good, so that's an easier call for us. But coming to the, the population, we have the same problem in Worcester, in Wrocław, right? So you also have people, hardly any unemployment. You also talk about Ukrainians also coming in, same thing all over. So I think that's something which I guess Poland has to address. Although in the back of my mind, right, you've got 38 million people, shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> I mean, look at Singapore, I mean, obviously the scale is different. But, <laughs> but, but you think about it, I think that's something how you retool, reschool, and choose who you bring in. I think those are the kind of things from here. we. So, so I guess it's a matter of how you position ourselves. And I think our strategy is still being close to the customer. And I think that works. And I think some there's a view that, which I think is good. They feel that, relatively speaking, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, 
if I use that geographic demarcation, will grow faster than Western Europe. So I still think in, in the coming days, still, we like to think it's a good bet. Right, right. So at the end of the day, it's not only a manufacturing base. The trade-off is that as wages go up, they end up having a lot more consumption power. So that actually is the balance. So through the through our discussions, Joanna, you can clearly see that while you've been away from Poland for more than 10 years, the country is rapidly uh, diverging. Do you think the country is representing the right image that it is really changing to the world? Uh, definitely not. And uh, it's, it's always um, still surprising me how people who have never been to Poland going there, they are coming back and they are absolutely surprised and amazed how Poland is. And I think this is, um, I think we should stop to talk about our history and we should stop to highlight uh, wartime bravery. We should start to talk about modern Poland, about Poland as a uh, tech, uh, tech startup, uh, te modern country with young people, well education system, um, good for living, safe, clean, and this is the message we, we, we should. We, what we, uh, our problem is as well that we are very shy. So we should be proud about this, how Poland is. And I have, I think we have a problem. This is somehow for Polish people um, negative, talking very positive about Poland. And I think this is, this is something what we have to change. Mr. Lim, Gerald Lim. So HIP is a company that's been through multiple crises since the 1980s. So you guys have been through it all. You've been through the dot-com, the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis. And so you, the company knows very well. But where is the sweet spot? Because for, for a Singapore manufacturer, turnkey manufacturer, um, the question really comes down to if all of a sudden wages go up, minimum wages go up to 4,000 zlotys, um, how does the company prepare and how, what is the vision ahead for your Polish operations as much as you're content with your current situation? Well, you hope and pray that the overall economy gets much better. You know, in the manufacturing sector, it's, it's very tough. Before you, you get business, you have to invest, make all the capital investment in all your equipment. And then you hope the business comes. So I think the formula, which I think you mentioned, is, I think is the right one. Make sure it's a very stable environment, good infrastructure, good quality of skill, good education, good medical, if you ask me. And this is what will attract people to come. In a sense, it's a bit like Singapore, right? I mean, Singapore is also not a cheap place to do business. And you talk about finance being the same like a Singapore porn. And I think that is something you have to look at. And as long as you, you focus on that, then I think if we look at alternative places, we then will make comparisons as to, as you say, which gives us a good mix. But beyond that, it's, I think, a lot outside our control, whether demand regionally, globally goes up or goes down. And we all hope that it goes well. But I think so far, the way we look at it from a manufacturer is we try to hedge is not the right term because it's not as if, well, in the past, you could hedge Asia versus Europe and so on. Now, it's a lot more global. If things go up, everywhere goes up. Things go down, everywhere goes down. So I think it's more a case of managing the pace of your investment. So on, on one hand, you, for a small player like us, uh, you want to do business with the big boys where we are just uh, component suppliers. If you want to do more business, you ram up your production. But if you ram too much and sales go down, you're stuck. So it's a matter of calibrating uh, how you want to invest and uh, taking it slowly. And I think the other area which possibly could make a difference is besides the tax incentives, there are also the financial markets and so on. I think you mentioned the level of funding, say, in a place like Singapore compared to Poland. I think that's something hopefully evolves over time, your capital markets and so on. So when that grows, I think the whole ecosystem, I think, will then support itself. 
Yeah, it's, it's really about nurturing, maturing the entire ecosystem so that everything is really on a level playing field. Joanna, as Poland moves up the value chain, how does the messaging need to be revised and tweaked in your view? I think there is still a lot to do about the communication and the image of Poland and the Polish business abroad. This is what we said here. We are not anymore a country with a cheap labor, but we are still seen as uh, the message that our strength is not the cheap people, but well-educated, very talented, uh, hardworking. So it's now nearly 200 countries worldwide, and all of them are competing and trying to get investors and attention to get business, yeah, and to be seen in the way that, for example, Alibaba will choose them. Because I think choosing the place where you will invest, it's a lot about how is the perception of the country, not only how the country is, because... When you talk about Germany, people think high quality, very modern. Is it Germany today as it was 20 years ago? I think Poland is in many areas much more advanced, but not seen in this way abroad. Yeah. So I think the country must be managed as a company and the same with the communication. First of all, we should know exactly how is the perception and what is the Poland associated with. Then we can think about the strategy, what kind of message we want to send, and then we can think about the channels, how to build the channels. Actually, we are doing this. I think we have to take everyone on board, so starting from the government, governmental, non-governmental organization, but especially business. And I think this is exactly what we are doing here. The changing economic model of Poland comes amid growing talk of a new era as global warming opens up new shipping routes in the Arctic that could spell new opportunities for trade and business. That prospect has resulted in unlikely strategic alliances. China's Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin have said that they wanted to work together to develop the Northern Sea Route after China launched a polar Silk Road last year. Beijing and Moscow are also speeding up negotiations over infrastructure projects that rely on Arctic shipping routes to supply natural gas and other natural resources from Russia to China. It's little wonder that U.S. President Donald Trump had his eyes on the Arctic when he expressed interest in buying Greenland and received much flack earlier this year. In reality, how quickly are ice caps melting in the Arctic to affect the dynamic in the Baltic region? For now, the Northern Sea Route was ice-free for only two months of the year and remains economically unviable. There's been so much interest about the Arctic. This is really to both of you. You guys are both uh, working side by side. Is that really the case? It's a very difficult question because it's looking into the future and no one knows how the future will look like. I think it's too early to say whether this will be a game changer or not. All I know is that when you look at the four major uh, shipping lines, two of them have announced already that they will not use that one for ecological reasons. The third one of the four major shipping lines has said that they don't have any plans today. And the fourth one, I don't know what their intentions are. So I think it's a little too early to uh, take a position on that one. All I can tell you is when we made our business plans, when we uh, were working on this acquisition, we did not include any assumptions for this new route at all. So that's all I can tell you. If you had lived in Europe in 1910, and then you wake up in you are in Europe in 1930. You probably never expect what happened over the 20 years. And then in 1950 again, everything has changed. We look at the business in the normal regular life. Every day looks like exactly the same, but the world is changing. And uh, well, forecasting is difficult, especially if we think about the future. And I think the beauty of it is that no one. No one from us knows how this future will look like. All we know that uh, if we have to better prepare to get this uh, part in this new game of this new order, which definitely is going to happen right now between US, China and emerging countries, 
And we as a country, Poland, we just have to take part in this, uh, in this game, not because of our legacy, but because uh, this is something for our security, for us, for, for our children. From Polish perspective, I think it's not about, and this is the strategic target. A lot of different scenarios have been laid out as to whether the vessels in the high seas are going to be fully autonomous or semi-remote control. So we don't really know how the world is going to evolve. But one thing is clear, that change is constant and change is going to happen. So in this changing world, give us your vision about how you see Gdansk 5, 10, 15 years from now. Recently, we've uh, updated our strategy and the strategy of the port of Gdańsk up to 2030 with some perspective of 2050. And we were thinking about it more than one year. And the final outcome of it is quite simple. So the port of Gdańsk should be the number one in as many areas as possible. The first on the Baltic Sea, perhaps first in Europe, which can be difficult, of course, but uh, first as an innovative port, first as a generator of uh, new technologies and enabler of new technologies. And I believe that thanks to the port industry, not only the port itself, but the whole uh, maritime industry as an engine, the Gdańsk area can be the most prosperous and the largest agglomeration on the Baltic Sea, which right now comprises one million habitants. It can be even more innovative and therefore within 10 years it definitely can be the Singapore of the Baltic. Laurent, there's been so much talked about this game-changing investment from Singapore's PSA and DCT is already the largest container terminal in Poland. Spell that out for us. What is game-changing in your view, 2020s and 30s? Today we are the largest container terminal in Poland, that is right, but when we compare to other European ports, we are only handling 2.2 million TEUs. I foresee that there will be a lot of growth in the coming years. The country is still growing above the uh, average of the other European countries, so automatically the container business will increase as well. Also, there still is a shift from conventional transport to container transport that will increase the container business as well. So I still see a lot of room for growth in Gdansk, in the business we are in. On top of that, uh, we also do transshipment in Gdansk. And there I also see a huge opportunity for increasing the volumes. Because the transshipment today is sitting in Antwerp, in Rotterdam, in uh, Bremerhaven, to some extent in Hamburg as well. And only for a little part of the transshipment volumes is sitting today in Gdansk. Because not that many vessels go all the way to Gdansk today. We have two major Far East services that go all the way to Gdansk, but we are not able to attract today more motor vessels to come to Gdansk because we don't have the capacity. That's why it's important that we increase the capacity so that we can get more motor vessels with local cargo to Gdansk. But those motor vessels also have the opportunity to bring the transshipment volume that today is sitting in Antwerp, in Rotterdam, in Bremerhaven, to bring that transshipment volume also to Gdansk so that we can do more transshipment from Gdansk into the Baltic, which is cheaper because today when you have to do the feedering from Antwerp, for instance, it's much more expensive than to do it from Gdansk into the Baltic. So I still see today, yes, the terminal is, is large, it's growing, but uh, in 10 years from now, you've seen the plans that we have. We would like eventually to uh, go to full capacity of the terminal, which is 7 million TUs in Gdansk. So we see a great future for the port of Gdansk. And do you even foresee, if things go well, further investments by PSA into other terminals in port. For instance, Gdynia is only 30 kilometers away, and it's in fact run by a different authority. Do you see that happening? Okay, when I look from uh, PSA, we of course think that it's best to focus as much as possible on one terminal, especially if you want to do transshipment. Look at Singapore. We have one huge terminal where we are handling 35 million TEUs, where we are doing a lot of the transshipment from this part of the world to other parts of the world, even from this part of the world to this part of the world again. So the larger the terminal is, the better and the more efficient you can do all the transshipment. So we are focusing on our investment in Gdansk, and we think it's the best to make from DCT Gdansk the Singapore of the Baltic. 
In the world of supply chain and manufacturing, times are changing rapidly as economic models shift in the midst of trade wars, rising wages, aging demographics, and the growth of emerging markets that are scrambling to pick up some slack from manufacturing hubs such as China. Samsung Electronics, for one, quietly shut down its last remaining smartphone plants in China this year. Lured by cheap labor costs and huge tax breaks, Samsung has been scaling up its smartphone plants in Vietnam as well as in India. As Poland moves up the value chain, how does it need to navigate its new realities? As Poland sort of moves up the value chain and sort of becomes the Singapore of the Baltic, then do you guys have a plan B? I'm sure you can't share everything. Do you plan to open another base in the hinterland? Or, I mean, what is the strategy? What is the vision going into 2020, 2030? We're already looking at alternatives to China, like everybody else. So that's one. And obviously, if you look at our marketplace, obviously Asia is still a huge market, given our supply chain. And Vietnam, Thailand, these are common things, including India. But I think for Europe, we're still adopting a wait and see, primarily because our product mix is quite different. So whereas in this part of the world, it's more in the electronics, the phones and that kind of stuff, in, in the European side, it's more in the higher value added consumer products and into the automotive. So it's slightly different. But you're right, we are constantly looking at it. And I think so far, Poland seems to give us the right balance. A lot of it is historical. We're already there anyway. So I think so far we are comfortable. And of course, if things get better, and, and to us, really, it's, the logistics order is fine. But ultimately, it's the business demand. If the business demand is there, great, it will grow. If there's no business demand, we're going to have empty factories and empty ports, right? So, so that's it. <laughs> Joanna, I wanted to pick up this tech element. Wearing your other hat as a tech entrepreneur, tech incubator uh, boss, how can Polish companies or tech talent seize this tech momentum that is in Singapore. Singapore is an amazing tech hub, close to $7 billion of venture capital investments made last year. I'm sure the figures will be higher. This is the place where you have all these unicorns. This is something what definitely should happen as well in CE region and Poland, because so far, the tech startups, they don't have any platform where they meet together and think about the common strategy and they face generally the same challenges. And what would be the potential of the region is huge, yeah? because in the region every year, there is uh, like nearly 40,000 engineers graduated. It's like a million IT engineers there, very talented, very good. And what is missing is venture capital, which is ready to take a risk. And Singapore can be one of the places where we can search for this money. One final parting shot from the entire panel. All right, so our panel is about how investors can seize the opportunity via Singapore and Poland, two countries that can serve as great gateways to their region. Okay, Joanna? 30 seconds. I think concentrate on people, which uh, hard workers, very ambitious, and so out of the box. I think this can be a very big chance to starting business in Poland. Mr. Lim, you've been around the block. You know both sides very well, having traveled all over the world. Why are Poland and Singapore a match made in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure in heaven, but for me, I think it's about being close to the customer understanding where the market itself, and I think being part of EU is very important because it's not just Poland, but the whole region. Make sure it's a good, good workforce. Make sure you know what... You need to anticipate the business that's growing. And I think we're looking at it really from where the next wave is, is what the demand is, and what are you going to invest in. So from a manufacturer's perspective, it's understanding the whole ecosystem. So make sure you know where it is, make sure you get the right people and, and go with the flow. Mikolaj, um, a lot of different and changing dynamics. Uh, give us your best sell of Pomerania in a room full of investors. Fantastic location in between the end markets of Scandinavia, Germany, and Central Eastern Europe. Highly skilled people, great quality to price ratio when it comes to labor, and already a developed market, right? Contact us, right? And we'll, 
we'll, we'll guide you through. Yeah. So we are an investor in Poland, and I maybe can quote our group CEO, Tan Chongmeng. He said in one of our uh, internal uh, presentations, he said, it doesn't happen very often that we make an acquisition and that basically everything is in place. And so he is extremely pleased by the investment that we made, by the professionalism of the local team. And yeah, we, we are very happy with what we have seen so far. And we are very convinced that uh, we will have a great future in uh, Poland. Okay, Martin. You can come to Poland and invest because one of your blue chip PSA is next door. And let me thank Eva this, in this uh, moment and, and her team. Yes, yes. A lady who hasn't had any sleep for the past, I think, at least a week or two. That impossible is nothing. And we can help you and support in every single aspect of your presence in Poland. And we are happy to do that. Hope you enjoyed this perspective on Poland and its growing clout in the Baltic as we brought to you a live forum from the Singapore Maritime and Business Mixer. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time. Would be most grateful if you could subscribe and give us a quick review. Do make Maverick Dreamers and Thinkers a part of your weekly routine. And if you'd like to find out more about our podcast, go to www.brilliantmp.com for details. Until next time, to all the great dreamers out there, I'm Chloe Cho. Take care. Thank you.